Welcome everyone to the 10th anniversary of the Corporation's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Act. What I would like to do now is I'll call upon uh, a very special lady, Dorianne Raymond, who's going to come up and uh, welcome us all to Larrakia Country. Can you join me in uh, welcoming Dorianne? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am a descendant of the Dungalaba, Gulumbringan saltwater people, generally referred to as Larrakia. The Larrakia are the traditional owners of Darwin and surrounding regions. We have always been host to visitors on our traditional lands. Historically, we have welcomed Indigenous and international visitors involved in trade and cultural activities. Today, our traditional land is occupied by Darwin, the fast developing capital city of the Northern Territory. I've done many welcomes to country, marking an amazing variety of events and occasions, but never before have I presented a welcome which directly celebrates an act of parliament. The CATSI Act mirrors the Mainstream Corporations Act, but was devised to enable special measures for administering Aboriginal corporations. Like any piece of legislation, it has its supporters and detractors. On the negative side, some would say that it's too intrusive and controlling, occupying a sheriff's role of imposing ultimate control over how we govern our own organisations. Supporters would say that with an active registrar, the Office of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations puts in a lot of effort to assist us to meet the normal requirements of running business and have good governors in a modern world. Recent years have seen active and hands-on efforts to help our corporations find suitable managers and advisors, and at the pointy end, prosecute those unscrupulous operators who have exploited or stolen from representative organisations. This is welcome and useful. Larrakia Nation Aboriginal Corporation has received much assistance from OREC over the years, placing us under special administration on two separate occasions, and helped us through two difficult periods. The first of conflict and political instability, and the second time due to financial difficulty. Both occasions can be broadly described as a failure of governance. Love it or hate it, when while the first Australians collectively learned to manage our own affairs towards prosperity and social inclusion, the CATSI Act will remain part of our lives. Most Aboriginal run service delivery is in the not for profit sector, has the CATSI Act as foundational operating guidance. I look forward to a day when the registrar is a first Australian and when we have a guiding role in determining amendments to and the creation of legislation that is specific to First Australians. Thank you and welcome. Then I invite the very important Queen of the Kimberley, uh, Mary G, to the stage. Thank you, Mary G. Welcome to my world. Won't you come on in? Miracles, I guess, still happen now and then. Step into my heart, leave your kiss behind. Welcome to my world. Welcome to my world. Everybody, come along. Yes, one big family. La 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 la, accountability. La 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 la. Welcome to Ori. Ah. Yeah. Can I now call up uh, onto the stage or to the area in front of the stage, the, the One Mob dancers? So One Mob different country members and I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we now stand on and wish you a safe and trouble-free journey whilst on Larrakia land. Can you please put your hands together for One Mob different country? <laughs> Oh, my God. 
I'd now like to invite onto the stage Senator the Honourable Nigel Scullin, Minister for Indigenous Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have to say what a pleasure it is to be here with you today. Uh, before I begin my remarks, let me just uh, start off by acknowledging traditional owners of country, the Larrakia people, and pay my respects to their elders, both past to them, to all Larrakia people who are, are here today. Uh, can I first of all thank Dorian for the welcome to country, and it's great to see you again, Dorian. Uh, could I acknowledge uh, Luke Gosling, uh, the member for Solomon, good to see you again, mate. Uh, Katrina Fong Lim, Lord Mayor. Um, Donna Odegaard, who uh, uh, was representing Larrakia Radio, she's also now on the Indigenous Land Corporation and a traditional Larrakia traditional owner. The staff, the directors, the supporters um, of all the many Aboriginal corporations who are with us today to assist in celebrating this really important day. Can I uh, also, I'm not sure if they've just gone, hey that one mob, good on your mind mark. Fantastic uh, dancers, and, uh, and it's great to see uh, such uh, ingenuity uh, and, and such great programs. They're all uh, currently uh, men who are incarcerated um, in the Northern Territory, but this program uh, releases them often to be able to perform, and they tell me that it's very important that they are all from different places, and they come together to share their dances and their culture. For these men, culture is law. So dancing is respect for law. These are not ideas of the Northern Territory Government or the Commonwealth Government or any government. These are ideas that come from the mob, uh, from these young men. So I wonder if you just put their hands together for just an absolutely outstanding performance. Now, people talk about self-determination. It's community corporations like yours that are the forefront of returning power and decision-making to communities. Community corporations are increasingly delivering services for their communities, health services, education services and employment services, just to mention a few. So we in government are making this move to community controlled organisations. This is the smart thing to do. There's just so much evidence that investing in Indigenous organisations and Indigenous individuals, communities and families is the only way uh, to deliver services. And uh, we know that you all understand the issues in your community so that the services you deliver will always be better informed than a non-Indigenous corporation. So that's why under the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, we've ramped up the number of Indigenous organisations that are winning contracts. Before the IAS, around 30% of services were being delivered by Indigenous organisations under the IAS. That's now jumped to 45% Indigenous organisations receiving 55% of the funding. Now, that's an outstanding outcome. And most importantly, uh, the Nerdu Wells who said, well, they're not ready. We don't have the capacity. It's all going to fail. They've been proved universally wrong. It's working really good for Alpa and the people in the Arnhem Land and North Arnhem Land and the five stores across the board. Thank you. In the words of the board and the CEO, best thing we did was to go under the CADSI Act and we've never looked back since. An increase of 15% has been absolutely sustainable and we've been able to demonstrate that the delivery of services has been better as a consequence. This has been an outstanding uh, outcome if you think about how risk averse government usually is about taking these decisions. It is about being less risk averse because if you understand this space it isn't a risk. We don't need to be afraid. This is a step we all need to take right across the, every level of government, right across government. If you're dealing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, you need to be dealing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations and functionality. So I've just made an announcement uh, recently, I think it's about three or four weeks ago in Cairns, where I spoke to the employment area of the IAS and they deliver my employment services principally under CDP. So I took it originally from 40% to 65% uh, and I've indicated 
to them, if you're not an Indigenous organisation by the 30th of June in 2018, you won't have a contract with me because they all come to bear there. So lots of holding of heads and a bit of howling. Uh, a few of the church organisations asking me how they become an Indigenous organisation. Well, they are some difficult conversations we're going to have. And I've indicated there are no exemptions available. So we are just going to have to be more innovative than we've been in the past if you want to be in this space. Given it's the 10th anniversary of the CATSI Act, it's, it's, it's a good time to remember the motivation and how we came to the Act. It replaced legislation that was over 30 years old and everybody reckoned it was pretty, uh, uh, wasn't really fit for purpose for the growing number of Indigenous organisations. So we are motivated to create a modern regulatory regime, sophisticated, would be an enabler for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations to grow and thrive in a, in a modern economy. We wanted to provide a regulatory regime that understood the very special role uh, the culture plays in communities and is able to adjust to the rules, the regulation uh, and, the, and the culture around that particular uh, community. So that's what we did with the Act. We made it a requirement, for example, that CATSI organisations needed to be owned and controlled by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations in order to be registered. That was about ensuring that control and ownership are really with the communities. The CATSI Act also strengthened protections for ordinary community members of the corporation and increased accountability in order to give government departments more confidence in contracting with Indigenous corporations. Well, I reckon uh, the corporations have done their part and I think government departments need to do more. Yeah, we uh, done a course with Oric a few years ago and we came up here from down Catherine. And uh, yeah, we done a good um, class work and that there, good workshop, but he was really good. Penalties for unscrupulous, unscrupulous behaviour were brought in line with the Corporations Act. But in recognition that wrongdoing most likely is to occur when a non-Indigenous CEO or member comes into the community and starts stealing or uh, some sort of a malfeasance within the organisation, we ensured that we extended the duties of directors to senior officers to ensure that the people who are most likely to be providing the mischief were caught under the Act. So that means that senior managers have duties they otherwise wouldn't, duties of care, duty to act honestly, duty to disclose, duties to trade, not to trade while it's insolvent. And one of the really unique things about the CATSI Act was that it legislated that the registrar had to provide education, training and support services to Indigenous organisations. So it's just not the bad guy, uh, it's also about an amicus role of standing with corporations to ensure that they can lift their capacity so that their vision can be, can be, that they run their world can be reached. So corporate governance, training workshops and courses including obviously accredited courses we provide at no cost to corporations. Whether it's on the phone or face to face support from help for running meetings to resolving disputes. They also provide recruitment assistance uh, service to help corporations recruit recruit key senior staff, corporations uh, are helped through this recruitment step, but the ultimate decision of who to hire is made by the corporation. The service is about making sure there's a sound process to ensure that we get to that point. So corporations can also advertise any of their jobs for vacancies for free on our ORIC website and many people come to ORIC that way. We also broker free legal assistance for corporations through its law help service. Corporations ask for help and we help them find a legal firm and we help them through that, particularly through not providing a charge. In more recent times, law help's been extended to help entities that need legal help to transfer their incorporation to the CATSI Act. So it was a bit of a mischief that people wanted to join and weren't able because of the capacity to be able to get that legal assistance. So they've said that would be a, a good thing to provide and we've been able to do that fairly seamlessly. The Independent Directory is another one of our three services and I had the pleasure of launching this uh, in 2015. It's a, it's a matching service, it's a, a parallel service. Having the right skills on a board is crucial to the sustainability of corporations. Skilled professionals wanting to share their expertise and knowledge can list themselves with ORIC and corporations can have a look at that list and compare the sort of skill sets that they think that they want. Uh, they can also check profiles against vacancies and let people know if there's, there's a match and I think that's an excellent service and, uh, and congratulations to, to Warwick for that. So I'm really pleased that I think, uh, and I, I would of course, and other people may have another view, but, but the CATSI Act has been successful. So these corporations, some of them have only uh, one or two members, others have thousands. 
Some have absolutely little or no income, uh, but, but some organisations like Alpa, you know, hundreds of millions. So they operate extremely large commercial enterprises, as I said, uh, millions of dollars annually. Uh, some derive their income entirely from government grants. Some of them have absolutely no government uh, uh, lines at all. Uh, half the corporations are based in very remote or remote regions. Uh, pro many provide essential services to their communities, sometimes the only service provider in some of those communities. But they've been doing some great things. There have been substantial improvement in their uh, uh, effectiveness, their efficiency, their sustainability and their accountability. Um, they provide support and legal assistance, um, governance advice, and they have great staff within um, the Oryx structure. Um, yeah, so I think, from my experience, I think they do a great job and they're vital for the survival of our organisations, um, particularly in the Northern Territory where we are. Um, we've seen a loss of a lot of organisations, but um, Oryx working with us, APON and many other um, Aboriginal leaders in trying to um, build that uh, momentum up again to establish all these organisations that are vitally needed in our communities. The statistics are quite clear, were, are very inspiring. So the key economic measures for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations uh, registered under the Act have exceeded the equivalent measures for mainstream entities. Again, for those who say we've got a CATSI Act because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can't get their act together. It's actually quite the opposite. Um, all measures, uh, those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations registered under the CATSI Act have exceeded the equivalent measures of all of the mainstream entities registered under ASIC. So revenue generated by the top 500 corporations has increased in the last decade by 74% from just over a billion dollars to 1.88 billion dollars. Largest 500 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations have achieved an average, an average annual revenue growth of 9.5%. Employment has increased by 59% from 6,948 to 11,095 employees. Just remarkable. Assets under, under management by the top 500 corporations has increased by 105% from $1.08 billion to $2.2 billion. Corporations have increased privately generated income, reduced their reliance on government funding. And of course, there are the people in Indigenous organisations who do the wrong thing. It's no different to non-Indigenous organisations, except that it's less. And what uh, I just think we really need to change that deficit narrative into a bit of honesty backed up by clear evidence and facts. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations registered has a lower wind-up rate, deregistration than mainstream entities registered under the Act. Indigenous organisations do fail at 0.5 of a percent. Non-Indigenous organisations fail at 0.8 of a percent. And if that fact surprised you, you wouldn't be alone. We're always hearing about negatives. Never that revenue is increasing, employment's up 59 per cent, Indigenous organisations are failing less than Northern Indigenous organisations. So let's change the narrative. When we're talking about these matters, let's just talk to people about how well the First Nations have done. You are all here doing an amazing job. And I hope, if nothing else for the day, we all leave here and become advocates for the Indigenous corporate sector, that we always remind people of the facts and data about our sector. As I've indicated under the IAS, 40% of organisations receiving funding compared with 30%. Our Indigenous procurement policy, we used to procure $6.2 million in 2013, $6.2 million out of the total Commonwealth spend to Indigenous organisations. 18 months later, $434 million in contracts. What an outstanding undertaking. People say, oh, that was nice, nice, well done. Well, don't look at me. Don't look at me. It was the quality of the goods and services provided by our First Nations corporations to this government that put them in that position. There's a huge increase in demand, fantastic growth uh, in the sector. We've just heard 74%. So I commissioned a review of ORIC to see how it's going, and today I'm going to publicly uh, release that report for everyone to have a look at. But the headline finding is ORIC's doing a pretty good job in a very tough regulatory environment. 
but there are opportunities for improvement. And that's a pretty consistent message that I'm hearing from the mob. Now, not everyone's supposed to be a fan of ORIC, and a bit like they're no fan of the tax department, but uh, no one likes paying tax. But I think there's a pretty healthy respect for ORIC, uh, and that's what the reviews found. ORIC does an incredible job up here in the, um, in the Northern Territory, helping Aboriginal corporations and training and mentoring and just providing that sort of legal assistance. And I think the, Ab the Aboriginal corporations have, have an incredible lot to celebrate. The CATSI organisations in the Northern Territory, they just go from strength to strength in terms of turnover, employment, um, success. Um, it's an incredible achievement. So well done CATSI, well done ORIC. Uh, one of the main findings is that we act immediately on is the need for more training to improve governance and we need additional resources for investigations for those times that we've done uh, the wrong thing. So I'm pleased to announce today that one of the things that I have done is immediate, because that's what the recommendation said, I've invested an additional $4 million of resources into ORIC over the next four years to ensure that uh, we can scrutinise those doing the wrong thing but we can also provide more governance training. There are a number of areas under the Act that need strengthening. Uh, that wasn't sort of in the terms of reference, but we've caught it up. We've captured that. That wasn't one of the operational parts. So I'm announcing today that the Registrar will be leading a technical review of the CATSI Act. And uh, to preface the question from the media, well, how come uh, we don't have an independent inquiry? Well, this is just about the Act. This is about the law. We'll make some recommendations and that will go to a parliamentary committee. But this is simply about there have been some recommendations around tweaking the actual act itself. We can hope that can be a technical review and be able to deal with that quite swiftly. Uh, if you haven't got a, a copy of the review, you will see it on uh, oric.gov.au. And what we hope to receive is, is a, a list of possible amendments that will go to a parliamentary committee. And we'd like to progress that relatively uh, swiftly. So again, I just want to thank you for being here today to celebrate uh, the 10th anniversary of the CATSI Act and the uh, achievements of the sector. I encourage you all to look at the report, which I, I think we've got some copies of uh, today, um, uh, and actually be able to take part in some of the exciting new initiatives that we're looking at to ensure that the Indigenous corporation is made very stronger in the future. But particularly to all of the corporations, their staff and their directors here today, thank you so very much. Um, thank you for coming, I really appreciate it and have a good day. Everybody please join in, this song is one thing about our people, Aboriginal people, we always laugh at our misfortune. That's what gets us through everything, all the time, we laugh and have a joke about things. So Minister, we're going to do that song together. Pobola, pobola me, oh yeah. Pobola, pobola me, oh darling. Pobola, pobola me. Okay, tell us, Anthony. Pobola, pobola me. Ah, oh, pobola, black, pobola, what are you? <laughs>